I'm super excited to be moderating today's panel about the secret to true 3D additive manufacturing with Kevin Carr and the illustrious panel that we've assembled with you today. Our goal over the next 60 minutes or so uh, is to dig into how companies are using 3D printing for what we call true real world additive manufacturing and distinguishing the hype all of the buzz around this technology from reality has been a little difficult. There's been a lot of chatter in the industry for some time that 3D would do everything, but that's really not the case. However, there are companies and there are people who are successfully employing true additive manufacturing, and they're seeing phenomenal results. That's what today's panel is all about. We want to dig into what the reality is and understand from today's panel what it takes to create an additive manufacturing process that really works. How do we distinguish the hype from the reality? Because we haven't met, I know some of you are uh, new to the ecosystem here. I wanna briefly introduce myself, and then I'm gonna bring the panel on and introduce them as well. My name is Dave Rosendahl, I represent Mindfire, and we are a marketing technology company. We partner with Master Graphics, and many of you here in the audience uh, to help you grow brand, drive leads, and generate sales. And I get to moderate these conversations and bring together this community of both 2D and 3D print folks to have conversations like these on a regular basis. So that's who I am, and I'm going to be moderating. You're going to hear me leading the discussion today. But really, more importantly, I want to introduce our panel. And I'm going to start first with Kevin, who is the president at Master Graphics. And for over 70 years, they've sold wide format and graphic printers, including uh, those made by HP, DesignJet, and Ose, some great brands. Uh, but more recently, they've expanded to offer a portfolio of 3D printing equipment from HP, 3D Systems, 3D Platform, Ultimaker. And so if you're in the market for a 3D printer, or if you're wondering, how does this technology help me and my organization? That's what Kevin and his team are all about. And their goal is to really live out everything that we're talking about today, helping companies transform from this hype of 3D printing to reality. And as the company's leader, I know Kevin's goal is to focus on their clients and to help the community really understand how to get value from their investment, including the time that they put into learning about these technologies. And so today's event is very much a demonstration of that commitment. Now, as I was getting to know Kevin a little bit before the event here to uh, bring him onto the, the panel here, I found out that he also has a podcast. So I wanna give a shout out to his podcast. It's called Padding 3D. And Kevin, it seems like you have a huge audience there of four loyal listeners. <laughs> At least that's yeah, what you told me. My mom, and my dad, and sisters. <laughs> and in addition to that, I know that you also spend your free time caring for your daughter's guinea pig uh, named Mr. Juice. So, Kevin, how the heck are you this morning? I'm doing great. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, the guinea pig is very near and dear to my heart now that all my kids are gone. It's the only thing I get to take care of. Let me introduce the rest of the panel to you now. I'm going to go left uh, to right here on the screen. I'm going to introduce the panel to you here, and then we're going to jump right in. First up on the left here is Lita Wood. Lita is Vice President of Client Success here at Mindfire, and she's relatively new to Mindfire, but she's not new to this industry. In fact, if any of you know Lita, let us know there in the chat. She has spent around the last 20 years with HP, focused on driving adoption of new technology, both in 2D print as well as 3D. And in all of her roles, she's been focused on helping companies embrace new technologies to ultimately drive revenue. And so Lita's mission is to help companies accelerate their growth. And she does that by investing in community like the community that's gathered here today, education, and helping business leaders really connect technology, emerging technology to business objectives like driving revenue and profit. So Lita, I'm glad to have you here with us today. You ready? I am ready. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Next up on the screen here, you see Kurt. Kurt Shodin is principal designer at Graco, and he has spent the last 14 years there working closely with 3D print to improve the manufacturing process. And as I've come to find, he's highly skilled at looking at challenging manufacturing issues and solving them with advanced additive manufacturing technology. And in his work, He's not only producing functional prototypes, but advanced tooling and fixturing that's cutting lead times down from weeks down to days. And he's improved production processes in a variety of arenas, including casting to machining. So he's really got a wealth of knowledge that I think you're all going to find very valuable 
as we get into the material today. So Kurt, thank you for being here today. How are you? Thank you very much. Good. Good to have you here. Thank you for being here. Next up is, is Peter Kutstra. He's the Director of Engineering at RE3D Tech. They're located in Chicago. And in his role, he works with engineers and designers to help navigate the process of utilizing 3D printing for prototyping and tooling, automation and production. And he specializes in generative design to reduce part cost and volume, which allows our customers to leverage their print farm for production. Peter, thank you for being here with us today. You're ready to get started? Sure am. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And then last but certainly not least is Michael Rosplock. He's the, man uh, the manager of digital manufacturing at Enterpack. And over the course of Michael's career, he's leveraged additive manufacturing to save businesses millions of dollars. And what's interesting about Michael is that he's not only an engineer, but also a leader in his organization. And he's excelled at both developing tough solutions for tough challenges and tough problems, but also leading teams around executing to meet those challenges. So Michael's current role is leading the research and development of DLMS technologies for applications in ultra high pressure hydraulic products. And they're using HP multi-jet fusion printed parts in production and helping businesses specifically theirs and their clients understand their investment in this technology and how it helps them drive outcomes. Michael, you're ready to dig into today's discussion? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, thank you. All right, folks, what we're gonna do today, here's how today's session is going to work. We're going to dive into a number of questions to try to tease apart what we need to know about this important topic. I have here in my hand, let me actually switch camera angles here. I have hundreds of questions that were submitted in advance by you in the audience. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to pose these questions to the panel here. And as I do that, I want you to be asking questions. I want you to be engaging in the chat, whether that's in Zoom, if that's in LinkedIn, if it's in Facebook, wherever you happen to be hearing from us right now, I wanna make sure that uh, we're able to see your questions and comments as they come in. So without further ado, Kevin, I'm actually going to throw the first question to you. And I know that as we prepared for the material today, we talked a lot about kind of the hype that has surrounded 3D print. And so for the folks that are here in the audience, and for me, in fact, it's true as well, discerning you know, what the truth is from fiction is difficult. And so I think my first question for you really centers around, do you agree with this, first of all, since you're deeply embedded in the industry? And if you do, why do you think this has happened? And what are some of the biggest misconceptions that folks have? No, I, well, again, and, and thanks, David. I mean, one of the reasons I was excited about this, because I'm a big one of saying hype versus reality. And I think part of the challenge is 3D printing has been amazing technology. And there was just a lot of hype. And I think at one point when we positioned it, we were saying we're going to replace everything. And over time, we realized it's not the case. And I know you're in marketing, so I'm going to be a little harsh. But I think sometimes the marketing over blew it, right? I mean, if you look at today, that hype versus reality, I look at our three guests today, you take Michael, who now does true additive manufacturing in a manufacturing cell that wasn't available three or four years ago. Pete's built a business around a service to produce parts using additive manufacturing in the supply chain. And then you have Kurt that's really augmenting added, you know, traditional manufacturing. So I think if you look back three or four years ago, we were promising all that. But with technologies, selfishly with HP, but carbon, all these others, we are actually now at that tipping point with our supply chain that's coming to reality. And these guys are a perfect example and gals are perfect examples of the promise finally coming to fruition. And I think we're understanding it better and where it fits, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the next one at you here, then digging a little bit further into what Kevin just said with respect to the hype that this industry has had over the last, let's say, 20 to 30 years. I'm curious, Peter, from your perspective, what aspects of the hype have actually become reality in the last few years? 
Yeah, no, and that's a, that plays a, a really large role in what's, you know, driving the growth of this recently. You know, you, the, the hardware has been there for quite some time, but there's been huge advancements in the material development, which has really enabled us to look at some new applications, as well as the, the, the print speeds, the ability to now do, you know, volume of parts in a shorter period of time. Uh, the HP system being a great example of that, where, you know, we can do hundreds, sometimes thousands of parts in an individual run. And that really enables us to now look at doing production. And that's almost entirely how we've been able to build our business. What percent would you say are prototype pieces versus production pieces, just roughly, that you're seeing right now? Yeah, you know, I would say it's definitely starting to grow in, in more and more production volumes to an ever-changing number. But at the moment, you know, we're still probably at about 70 to 80% prototypes, growing into about 20%, you know, production volume. And that that is even over probably the past two years grown, you know, and doubled. Excellent. Folks here in the audience, whether that's LinkedIn or Zoom, Facebook, wherever you are, as we're talking about these different aspects here, if we mention anything that you want to know more about, there is no dumb question. Please ask in the chat and my team and uh, the master graphics folks and the panelists will try to jump into the chat and answer that as well as take it here on the air. So don't be afraid to ask questions about anything that we say in order to clarify and gain the understanding that you're looking for. Kurt, I'm going to continue in the thread here for a moment, and I'd just love to get your opinion in terms of, you know, this hype that we've been talking about. What are you seeing that's becoming reality now over the last few years from your perspective there at your company? For us, it comes down to one thing is pretty much dropping FDM and going with HP. We've seen our, uh, we went from weeks to a month of backlog with parts, and now with HP, we're a two to three day turnaround. And we're talking uh, 26,000 parts we're at in one year with the HP, which you know would have been years with FDM. So the material is awesome with HP. Um, that's our biggest thing is just the throughput with HP. Excellent. Thank you, Kurt, for that. And you're sounding pretty good now. So thank you for yeah. uh, adjusting your mic yeah, there. I appreciate that. Yeah. So as we were preparing for this, I'm gonna throw this first question uh, to you, Michael. Uh, this next question here, we, we talked about this concept of a 3D print manufacturing cell. And uh, I'd love for you to talk for uh, just a moment, Michael, about what do we mean when we say cell in the context of a 3D print manufacturing organization? So Michael, help us understand that concept here and why it's important. Yeah, let's just compress the last three years of my career into a minute and a half, two minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a tough question to answer. And I think if you just Google, like, what is a manufacturing cell? It really gets into Kaizen just in time, sort of like a modular component of a production site. They'll, they'll talk about it that way. And how I really like to think about it is for whatever you're producing, it's got everything you need to bring that product, whether it's an assembly, machining, that cell is all of the, that component of a process for producing a physical component lives within that cell. And it's really, and by production, I think is really the heart of this question. What does that mean? As someone who tried in, in my company to run an FDM print farm, and I tried to make that happen. It was my dream coming out of college. The problem ends up being reliability, um, the amount of time you're spending on the weekends, coming in, fixing machines. You need something reliable. That sounds like fun for a while until it's been nine months of coming in on Sundays, Saturdays, staying late, fixing machines, parts not sticking to the bed. You need something reliable. You need something that is going to, yeah, just reliability is really the biggest key piece. And throughput, like everyone else is saying, along with that material property, being able to produce a production grade part. I always say you've got to be able to produce a good quality part first, and then you worry about the cost and the throughput. And I think HP meets that. If you go get your sample part, you'll find that. It likely will blow you away with how good it is. And then the business math just comes later on from that. But a uh, little bit of a roundabout answer to that question, but hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, definitely makes sense. I'm curious, Kurt, what's your view of this? Would you describe it the same way as Michael did, or do you have a, another perspective on this? It's a little bit different here. So we design, manufacture, and market OEM parts. So anything has to go through, everything has to go through engineering first. So manufacturing, they can buy a machine, but we have to prove it all, right? Because you're making your parts lighter, stronger, and we have to retest them in engineering before they can go into manufacturing cells. So we have to, what we're currently doing now is we, we probably have, have about 20 parts that we send to manufacturing, but we run them all here in engineering and we tested them. It's coming down to pretty soon they're going to have to buy their own. Uh, machine and then start their own cell over there. 
Peter, what about you? How do you define uh, manufacturing cell? Yeah, you know, and I think this is interesting because it, it highlights how different companies and different profiles, you know, look at this. And because for us, best way for, for, for me to describe that is a flexible manufacturing setup. You know, we might be making parts for a company like Graco one day and then have to turn around and make, you know, marine products the, the next. And sometimes that involves assembly, sometimes that involves, you know, heat set inserts, and sometimes, you know, things like different surface finishing options as well. So we need to be able to pivot pretty regularly during the manufacturing process. So when we refer to a manufacturing cell, it's intended to be flexible and, and be able to find the solution for the customer, whether that be, you know, matching a black color or just being able to assemble an actual component as well. Well, Peter, I want to keep you on the hot seat for a second. I'm going to dig into something there that I think is definitely of, of interest to me. And I think many here in the audience, I saw a number of questions come in around, you know, this idea that traditional manufacturing has many standards and many defined processes. And so I, the, the audience is curious, and I'm curious if you're seeing the same kinds of standards being implemented around 3D. And related to that, then what kinds of volumes are you able to economically produce through the, the configurations that, that you work with? I'll start with you, Peter, and then I'll move on to the others and see what their views are on that too. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing that I've seen, and maybe one of the reasons why, you know, there's been some pushback on adoption is that people are trying to apply existing quality methods or existing production mentalities to 3D printing, meaning we'll get a lot of 2D drawings that have materials called out on them that are not specific to this process. So one of the biggest advancements that we've seen in, in, in enabling production for 3D printing is calling out the specific HP material on your 2D drawings, which helps better define, you know, what you're actually looking for, then actually reviewing the tolerances uh, on that drawing. We get a lot of over tolerance drawings to where, you know, that's just not a, a manufacturable part for this process. But after a half hour meeting with an engineering team, we're able to get it dialed in and that's an easily producible part. Looking at it through the lens of not just, well, I've always tolerance my parts this way, or I've always used just an HP or just a PA12 material, but rather calling out the actual HP specific material on your drawing, getting it set up so that companies like Enterpack have that in their system for, you know, the, the history and the duration of making that product. And then from there, you know, one of the things that's helped enable it is for us, at least as well, is an open communication with the customer as this is uh, being produced. With additive being so new, we have to jump on new challenges as they present themselves. And in doing so, we've been able to grow our production volumes to where we're now doing roughly about 20 to 30,000 production parts. Every year. Okay. Very good. Michael, I'm going to uh, ask you the same question here, but I just wanted to mention that I see TJ. I see your question here, TJ, in the chat. And uh, folks, keep those coming in. And uh, my team's going to pull all those together, and we're going to leave time towards the end to get into those questions. So please continue to drop those in. Michael, my question for you is similar to what I just asked Peter. From your perspective, what volume are you able to economically produce? Yeah, that's a good question. So I know Pete likes to talk in number of parts. And I know a lot of people like to look at it that way. I tend to look at it like cubic volumes, like per pounds of plastic produced. Just depends how you like to look at it. We produce a lot of larger parts. So we will do a lot of like shrouds and things, you know, like injection molding replacement shrouds. And those can be two parts per bill, but they're huge, right? I don't know. We're producing, what is it? 20,000, 25,000 pieces per year is what the run rate is right now. Um, looking at, you know, utilization rates somewhere in 30 to 40%. So um, looking pretty good that way. And that's all based on a lot of assumptions and a lot of math that way. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at on that. Do you want me to touch on this industry certification question quick or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's touch on that. Yeah, I was going to say that was what I started off with because, you know, you start off in engineering and say, I found this really cool new printing technology. And they're like, okay, well, what about UV certification? What about moisture absorption? What about long-term, you know, reliability? What about, so it's all those whatabouts. And I think HP and the industry as a whole, you know, initially go, yeah, we're ready for production. And then all those questions come up, like, are you ASTM certified this and this? I think at first there was some of that had been done, maybe not to the level of detail that people were looking for and like really understanding because, you know, you work with injection molding suppliers and they go, yeah, well, you can order UV or, you know, fire resistance of this and a UV rating of this and impact modifier that, right? 
And that just ends up on drawings from 40 years ago and everyone's okay with it, right? And then people hold a little more scrutiny though, I think to a new process, right? They say, okay, that sounds great, prove it, right? What'd you do? What was your testing? Can I see your test reports? What was your sample size, right? And those are, you know, when you start getting into the white papers from HP and stuff, I just think that the data is there depending on the level of scrutiny you take to it. It either will satisfy your requirements or you might want to do some of your own testing or you might need to set up a call with HP and talk with the engineers who ran those tests. I just, I implore you to really look at the standards that you're, you're holding and make sure that you're being equivalent between your injection molding suppliers and your printing suppliers. I guarantee that there's, there are, there's some more leeway on those injection molding suppliers than you realize. And you're probably over, you're probably over scrutinizing your new additive suppliers just because you're not familiar with it. So that's what I would say as far as those go. The material holds okay. up is, is what it is, right? It lasts in outdoors and really performs really well. So let me just clarify for everyone who's wondering, Michael's responding to a comment here in the chat from TJ Hendrickson saying, are industry certifications worth it? I teach this and I'm always looking for a leg up for students. So TJ, thank you for the question. Before I move to the next question, I want to ask you as well, a uh, similar line of questioning here around what kind of uh, volume, what part volumes can you economically produce? Pretty much with the, with the HP process, it's unlimited. You know, we're taking parts out of manufacturing that are injection molded and cutting the cost down about one third. And we're doing anything from 300 to 2000 parts on this machine, all supporting engineering at the same time in manufacturing. So two to three day turnaround by the time it's cooled, blasted or died and out the door. And it, it's just unbelievable. So it's, it's pretty much unlimited with the HP system. So it sounds like it's been fairly successful for you. And that's my next question, Kurt. I'll stay with you. Give me your your top, let's call it your, your top success or the thing you're most proud of from implementing additive manufacturing. If you look back over the last couple of years, what's something that stands out to you as one of those shining moments? So for us, I'm in specifically new product development. So we have to keep our customers happy, right? And this is a part here, if you can see it, it's a wet cup that has threads in it. And, you know, $25,000 injection mold, we only need 500 a year. So we just print them. The lead time on the outside, this is an MPT thread right here. It's 84 day lead time on the outside. So with HP, you're able to print that thread. Done and put them in the blaster, dye them and send them to manufacturing in a matter of days. So it's just, it's just crazy that, uh, this technology is altered, but for me, it's definitely cutting down new product development time. Awesome, folks. If you want to see that, I'll have Kurt pull that back up on the screen again uh, next to the camera. Thank you for bringing the uh, the item there. That's helpful. Yep, there we go. I don't know if you yeah. can see that there, but thank you, Kurt. Peter, what about you? Give us a highlight, a success, uh, something that you've seen from the last couple of years in terms of implementing additive manufacturing in the way we've been discussing here. What stands out to you? Yeah, you know, we have been very fortunate to work with some uh, really incredible and big name companies on developing out, you know, actual production products. And, you know, the first thing that I'll say is it's not a, a quick process out of the gate. You know, Michael had mentioned it is that newer technologies, especially internally, you know, with some engineers that have been there and, and you know, use traditional manufacturing methods for a while, I usually have quite a bit of a pushback on it. And uh, the specific project I'm talking about here it was about a year long development cycle. Now we only do about 10,000 units per year with them. So not a huge product in relative to, to what they do, you know, with, with some of their other products. However, it's a very specialized niche product. And one of the things that I, I love about my job is what some of these products end up doing down the road. And so this is used for industrial kind of pipe scanners to the gas and oil industry it helps in the long run, provide a lot of resources to individuals, you know, here in the U S it's, we uh, take it for granted, but around the world, being able to have access to renewable sources like oil and make sure that's safe all starts with being able to scan that pipe. And so the, the products that we make end up going on to that, that pipe scanner and it's a very complex product. They were able to design it in a way that, that they weren't before. And in fact, when we had started out, 3D printing wasn't even at, at top of mind. They weren't even looking at it for a production method. But when we looked at the, the yearly quantities, it made sense. And uh, to, to Michael's point, a lot of times the parts do the talking. It started out as a prototype opportunity. I just printed them a, an HP part, sent it to them. And the next thing you know, we're on a year-long journey to do a production part. 
I see Chuck just mentioned injection uh, molding here in the chat, and that's actually a good lead into my next question. I'll direct this first at you, Michael, and then I'm going to probe the rest of the panel as well. I'm curious if we can talk for a moment about how you see 3D printing sitting alongside or complementing traditional manufacturing. We hear a lot of comparisons uh, to injection molding, and I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. Let's start with you, Michael. Yeah, I'll touch on one other thing I saw in chat too. We're talking about mostly the, the HP MultiJet 5200, 4200 series, or yeah, 4200 series, as far as what printer we're talking about. I don't know if Kevin wants to show a picture of it or drop that in the chat or something. I'm personally running the 5200 series. Love it. I think Peter's got a mix and Kurt, I think you're still in the 4200 series. So anyway, that's just wanted to answer that quick. But along with that, how it sits, and I saw some other comments in chat. Yeah, it, I think additive definitely lends itself to lower volume, high complexity, short lead time, reactive, we'll call it like pinch part production and underpacks, you know, and with the world as it is right now, I mean, everyone's dealing with supply chain issues, right? I mean, um, yep. you know, additive is the perfect solution. If you are using, you know, plastic components for your business, additive is the perfect solution to fix those problems. And you might end up with parts that the part cost is higher than an injection molding part, right? If you have a tool that was made 10 years ago, it's fully amortized, and you're just running parts out of it, yeah, you're getting the benefit of that scalability, all those things, right? But the tool breaks, there's a rev change, there's any other issue like that, or you know, parts are backed up in port or whatever it might be, additive can spool up like that. And I think Peter was talking about flexibility, and that is absolutely huge. Um, as someone who writes business cases for this stuff, I call that like a soft cost savings. And it's really hard to like financially put on a, on a piece of paper and write down what the value of that is. But when you save a million dollars, millions of dollars in revenue of shipments at the end of a quarter, you know, at the end of a quarter that you were going to miss without these parts, nobody is, nobody's questioning, does the printer pay for itself? So that would be my comments on that. Lita, I don't want to skip over you here. I, I want to get your perspective on the question that I just asked with respect to, you know, how 3D printing sits adjacent to or complements traditional manufacturing. What are your thoughts on that? Actually, Lita? my favorite, can you hear there me? There we go. There yes. Go. Um, my favorite's end of life, actually. So you can be producing a part on injection molding or what have you, but when you get to end of life, you don't want to have thousands of parts sitting on a shelf. What you do want to be able to do is to deliver to your customer on demand a part and the price, and the price doesn't matter so much. So for me, it's always been end of life and being able to see, you know, the value of not having to store those parts somewhere all around the world. Got it. Kurt, interested in your thoughts on this. How do you view the two sitting next to one another or complementing each other? Yeah, I think they work uh, hand in hand perfectly. You know, you get... Um... You get injection mold right now. The lead times on tooling is crazy. The cost of them are through the roof. You know, you, you know, four or five tools are over a hundred grand and you can design it, you know, use a little DMF um, generative design in it to uh, lighten up the part and make it stronger, which obviously you can't um, injection mold. It works great sitting alongside. And like, like we said, if a tool breaks or end of life, it's really great to just pick it up and redesign it a little bit and get an HP and it's running in a matter of days. Peter? Hours, I should say. <laughs> Hours? Okay. <laughs> uh, Peter, what about you? Let's wrap up with uh, your view on this, and then I'm going to move to the next question here. So just give us your sense for how the two uh, complement one another. Yeah, you know, and that's, if I had to describe my job in, in, in just pretty much one sentence, it'd be boiled up into this, where we have to evaluate what is the best, you know, manufacturing technology based on the part and the 3D geometry that I'm looking at that a customer has sent. And so we have to look at some scenarios where, you know, one beats out the other. And in some instances, it's actually a combination of both. So applying, you know, traditional manufacturing methods with 3D printing is also pretty important and, and something to keep in mind because it, it just requires you to look through maybe a bit of a different lens. And maybe a good way to describe this is the scenario that everyone else is, is in right now with COVID where supply chain has been disrupted. If you don't have access to your parts, it makes a lot of sense to look at a backup or an alternative manufacturing method rather than no production at all. So in some, some instances, we're working with companies not to prove out their production part, but to pr prove out the backup production method so that if they 
all of a sudden can't get to parts for 60, 90 days, we have a way of actually being able to backfill and provide that uh, to the customer. Yeah. So Peter, that was kind of my next question. Sure. You know, supply chain issues are definitely clear, right? I mean, we're seeing those in all sorts of different areas, 2D, 3D, even household items. Obviously it's affecting us across the world. So you touched on it briefly, but are there, is there anything else that you would want to say to everyone here around how 3D printing is able to help us and help companies address, you know, these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. And it was mentioned earlier being, you know, that storing something on a shelf. And one thing I'll post to the audience is to think about how much it costs just on a yearly basis to store an item up on the shelf. And, you know, we're seeing it now, like you'd mentioned with the, the supply chain issues, but a lot of people look at it as, well, we just need to, to throw more on a shelf to be able to have uh, there available, you know, in the long run, if we have these, you know, peaks and valleys of needs. However, you know, it is very expensive to just keep something stored up on a shelf. So just saying, hey, we need to keep more to be able to ride out the, you know, the storm of COVID might not be the best approach. In, in some instances, if you have huge you know, peaks and valleys to your quantities demand, technology like 3D printing is going to be a perfect fit because we can turn around, be able to provide 10 parts in, in a matter of days, but also 10,000 parts in a matter of days. Some people are a little surprised when we provide quotes back and our lead times are the same for one part as it is for that 10,000 volume. That instantly forces them to start thinking about, well, how can I use this in my supply chain? Kurt, what about you? Insights on supply chain challenges and 3D printing addressing some of those challenges. What's your view on that? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the same deal as, you know, like this wet cup part with 84 day lead time to machine it, which is crazy, right? It, it's definitely no parts on the shelf and it's on, on demand. That's the biggest deal. Lita, what about your view? I know you've seen a number of organizations. In fact, yesterday we were just in a meeting where we were hearing from a, a different industry, but you know, similar challenges. Everyone's got this challenge. So how do you see 3D helping to address the problem? I mean, I'm repeating the same thing in some respects that really there's disruption now, but there's disruption all the time, right? And so companies shouldn't just now be thinking about this. They should be building it into their plans to always be producing a 3D um, design at least, even if they're going to do something on it, you know, they really need to have that plan um, in place. Something to be thinking about all the time. Michael, what I want to ask you, uh, I'm going to start with you, is, you know, if you can share with us, how do you justify the investment in 3D print to management? In other words, if there were any lessons learned through this process that you've been through to build the business case, what kinds of insights would you share with somebody who's considering doing the same thing? Yeah, I could, uh, well, and I have, I could talk for, I could do the whole panel just on this topic all by itself for at least an hour. I mean, it is, a, it's complicated. It's super specific to your business, your needs, your executive team, who's the purchase, you know, what's your experience with additive? I would say, go get a sample part made from a service bureau, right? Call up Pete. Get a part made. Are you does it work for what you need, right? Do you need ultra, you know, space age, carbon fiber, crazy temperature, whatever plastic, or does nylon 12 work for you, right? And I think that's the first step is say, does this process, is it feasible? Is it what we're looking for? Go find the machine that does that, you know, and HP might not be the right solution for what you're trying to do. It's not metal, right? If you need steel parts, sometimes you can replace them with a plastic or aluminum but you need to go find the right technology for what you're trying to do. I, in my opinion, I think, you know, do that engineering research up front, you know, get the, get a couple parts designed, get them in the lab, you know, build some confidence around the technology. And then I did, would just sit and wait for the, the next big problem to come up. Right. And my business, you know, we had supply chain disruptions. We were able to solve them very quickly, you know, save millions of dollars in revenue and away we went. Right. Other businesses might have a whole portfolio of products that they're like, if we had this machine, we could produce all this stuff. It would be great. We'd take out inventory. We could stop, you know, we could obsolete some of these things and sunset this product. You might have a whole portfolio of parts that you already know. And I would call that a more traditional business case. Then just go buy the, you know, just work with a guy like Kevin or Pete, figure out how to run these machines in, in production, bring them on your site and just go get it, right? 
So those, and that's just a couple of different ways to tackle it. I'm sure the other panelists will say similar things or have a few other different stories, but I would really base it on that. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, Kurt, to give us your perspective on that, but I want to read what some of the folks here in the audience are saying. Uh, Lee, remind me what company you're with. Lee says, I have, uh, I'm a hobbyist now with four printers. Not sure if it makes sense yet for our commercial print company. So it's, Lee is in the 2D print business, it sounds like. And Lee, forgive me, I'm, I'm not remembering your company name, but let me know so I can read that out here. Dar says, not yet considering acquiring equipment. We work with one additive manufacturing in Toronto. Drew is saying, I'm trying to gauge when it's a good time to get a small printer for replacement parts when we don't have a traditional part on hand. Lee is with Abco. Okay, got it. Yes, that's right, Lee. Thank you. All right, Steve, I'm going to get to your question here in a second, but Kurt would love for you to give your perspective on what your biggest lesson learned is that you could share with the audience here around building a business case um, as to when to make this investment and how to make this investment. What's your view on that? So for us, it's, you know, you got to have cost savings to get the, to do a CER, a capital equipment request. We took 3,500 parts we out of the, our model shop or machine, you know, they're over hundred bucks an hour. We took those and then we took out, outsource cost, which is, you know, could be up to 10 times more than doing them in-house. And then of course, switching from FDM to HP, you know, it's, it's the price of the material cost is way cheaper. And then the runtime is, you know, 25 times faster. So we took all that, came up with the CER for the big wigs here and they approved it, no problem. And then we came back a year later and out of those 3,500 parts, we actually ran 19,000 first year. So our CER came way down on that. So that, that's how we do it here at Graco, cost savings. Peter, what about you? How do you build the business case for the investment in this technology? Yeah, well, uh, at least for us, we, we probably have the easiest justification because that's our, our whole business. But what I can say is we help companies all the time make the justification. And one thing I, I want to clarify too, we're your friend in this whole additive journey. Some people look at us as an outside supplier. We always want to retain that. But the, the reality is a lot of our customers actually have printers and we have helped them to actually decide what printers they want to go with. And you'd be surprised that even some of the big name companies that reach out to us and they've spent three months doing development on a, a part that they want to get FDM printed and they go, we validated the material, validated the design. Can you give us a lead time on getting this part printed? And we'll come back and be like, well, if you're going to do that in FDM, it's going to be two years before you get your parts. And if it's HPMJF, we can get it to you by the end of the week, if you're looking for it. And uh, they realize pretty quickly, like, okay, well, maybe we don't have to go the FDM route. Maybe we can actually go, you know, an alternative route and we'll sit down and go through the individual part costs, what it actually entails to make that individual component and accomplish what they're looking for. And uh, from there, you know, it's going to be a natural decision on, on their part, whether they bring it in-house or continue to, to outsource it to, to a company like us. But even in that scenario, when they do bring a technology in-house, we can be their backup supplier, right? If the production volumes hit, you know, to be too high, we can just take that build file that they already had developed internally and plug it into our process. And so they can, you know, really quickly double the capacity uh, that they have available. And that, that is really just a testament to the growth in the technology and the industry. I want to give everyone an opportunity to uh, visit this URL here on the screen. When you go to that page, folks, this is what you're going to see. There's a little form there on the page. If you want to talk further with Kevin and his team, if you have questions for anybody here on the panel, fill in this form and we will triage all the requests that come in and then get you connected with the right people. So if someone here on the uh, panel has said something that has piqued your curiosity, if you're thinking about whether or not this makes sense for your business, if you're trying to figure out how to solve a challenge, that you or potentially a client has, then take a moment, uh, jot down this URL, go in and fill it out. And uh, we'll make sure that we get you connected with the right person uh, so that we can answer your questions. Kurt, I'm gonna ask you a question here. Just give me real quick, one thing that excites you about the 3D space as you look out over the next, let's call it 12 to 24 months. What's something Kurt that you're excited by that you're seeing right now? Plus, it's going to be uh, metal printing coming down the road. We do a lot of investment castings here, and the lead times are crazy. The suppliers are they're just all backed up. Definitely metal, and not the laser, you know, the million-dollar machines, but the sintering uh, metal printing is going to come around here pretty quick, I think. 
Peter, what excites you? One to two years as you look ahead, what's on the horizon that's got you excited? I'll be a broken record and say metal as well. That's really my, my love. And, you know, we do actually offer every middle metal printing process available in the additive space right now. You know, that includes e-beam, DMLS, you know, the Mark Forge Adam process. And we're learning a lot on the sintering end, but there's going to be some huge advancements in the available materials, as well as some newer technologies rolling out there that it, it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. I see some folks are taking an opportunity to talk with Kevin and his team. So make sure if you want to speak further, when you type in this URL or when you click on it here in the chat, go ahead and fill that in so that we can make sure that we, we get you the help that you need. And I will try to answer as many questions on the air as possible. Michael, I'm going to turn to you now as you look ahead over the next 12 to 24 months. The world is crazy. Things are changing every day. But what excites you that you see ahead uh, and around the corner? Yeah, it's going to be metal for me as well. I mean, personally, for us, as far as hydraulics go, DLMS is a lot more mature, a lot more developed as far as material properties go. And that's what we're really looking at, you know, like actually investing into in the next little bit. I would probably put the sintering technology. I might be a little bit, I'm usually pretty gung-ho about all this stuff, but I'm going to say sintering is probably not quite two years yet. I'm thinking it's going to be a little longer for material specs and all the process capabilities that come together on it. But I think like it's the next two years is probably the right time to start working with it. If you want to be, you know, ahead of the curve or with the curve, I should say, but I'm excited for that technology too. I think Kurt said, yeah, like casting replacement. I think it, it could be an awesome fill in for any of those parts that like plastic won't quite cut it, but you don't need ink and L you don't need titanium. You, you don't need that level of part, they have a lot higher throughput. They scale a lot better. The cost per pound is way better with those sintering technologies. And I think there's, I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be ready to go for prime time, probably early investment and starting to work with service bureaus in the next two years. And then um, I think they'll really trickle down from aerospace medical and hit more manufacturing level within five years for sure. That's my guess anyway. Very helpful. All right, folks, let's get into the Q&A now. And so the way we're going to run this panel, I can see you in front of me. So wave your hand if you have an answer to uh, these questions that I'm about to throw at you. This has come from the chat. So regardless of uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Zoom, or Facebook, my team is going to be pulling this, dropping questions in uh, so that I can see them. And if you've asked a question as we've gone through the material today and we haven't, for whatever reason, answered that, go ahead and repaste it back in just to make sure we don't miss it. So I'm going to pull a few here. The first one is for Tyson. So please, panel, wave your hand at me when you're ready to answer this. Tyson is asking, what secondary operations for support material removal, as well as the surface finish modification, have you utilized for end-use parts? So who's got a good response uh, for that one? All right, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, you know, support structures are, you know, can be very tricky. We have every hand tool you could ever imagine and surprisingly finding the right style of picks being able to get the support structures off can be quite uh, difficult I, I i can probably follow up with a link to a few different items that you know we use for support removal but i would say as well on the front end taking some time to design out customized support structures can save you sometimes hours uh days it feels like in removing it when you're doing production parts TJ is asking again here, and I think this is good because this is uh, an aspect that is really important as we invest in the future of this technology. TJ is saying, what are things for students to help them learn that's going to help them in rapid prototyping and fabrication as they develop into industry positions? And so obviously staffing, finding qualified resources is very important and challenging for many industries situation right now. So what are your thoughts, panel? Go ahead and let me know who's got, who's got a perspective on this. Yeah, Kevin, I'll go with you and then I'll go to Michael. Uh, make sure to unmute, Kevin. Yeah, I got it. No, sorry, Michael, to take it. But I would say, especially, you know, one of the things I'm very bullish about is people like Michael and Peter. Sorry, Kurt, you're older like me. But the younger generation coming up, and if you look at, like, even in the Midwest, the MSOEs, the Northwest Technical Colleges, they're beginning to be courses that are designed for additive. And I, what I'm personally seeing is those courses are training the skill set that we need to really implement it. So that's what I get excited about. So if you are in that, you want to be in that realm, I think, I know Pete went to MSOE. I can't remember Mike where he went, but I think that if you're, there are programs out there and we truly, almost everyone in the industry has taken some type of specialized class around that. 
And it's been, like I said, to me, hugely beneficial for those students to come in and impact our industry at a very young age. It's their opportunity to grow and replace us older guys. Michael, why don't you give a retort to the old guy there? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'll say you know, Gophers here over and uh, over here. And um, now that we've got our axe back, it's all good. You know, MSOE, great, great college too, though. Yeah, I would say so. I came from the school of I bought a printer when I was 18. Before I went to college, I was printing parts for kids and I was running a little business. I mean, I just learned by doing and I really recommend that. I mean, back then, the lowest cost FDM machine was pretty expensive. Now, I mean, you know, 100, you know, for two or three hundred dollars, you can get a Creality something system. Go get one. Start playing around with printing parts at home. I think Learning by doing is the best way to go. Um, if you're in engineering or anything like that, all the old guys are looking for a, someone to run the printer at the office, right? And I think that's a great, that's where I started, right? And I think that's, you know, learning by doing is my, always my favorite. And I translated from FDM into going to a trade show is really what opened my eyes up um, to what industry is, what industrial, what I'll call industrial 3D printing is. Um, and I just went from there, started asking questions and I've always been passionate, excited about it. So that's what I'd recommend. But yeah, there are going to be lots of, you know, college courses. MIT puts on a nice um, additive. MIT, it's like Pro X, I think, or something. And I've taken a couple in metal printing, which those were really good as well. So yeah, I mean, if you want to get into this, it's, you know, I think some colleges have like a class or two on it, but you're really going to have to lean into it. Go ask questions, go find people on LinkedIn, attend webinars, buy a machine yourself, right? Just get started. Here's a little bit of a detailed question. Uh, I'm going to throw this at you, Kevin. And if we don't know the answer necessarily, we can follow up on this. But this is a question that came in earlier from Tyson. Does the HP uh, MJF printer have UL94 flammability rated V0 material options, Kevin? And you know, you, I'm not the uh, I'm not the AE, but it does not have a V0 rating at this point, right? I mean, it's one. If we get that question all the time. I'm sure all three of these guys get it. There's some work on it. But I think because of the technology, particularly MJF is not, is harder to do versus like an SLS would have a V0 rating, if I remember the right P. But that's, a again, offline, a good one to follow up because there continue okay. to be advancements. Okay. A supply chain related question here. This came from Steve Martin. I'm sorry, Steve Marvin. Forgive me, Steve. <laughs> With supply chain issues. Are you seeing any issues with getting the actual material to print parts? Anybody seeing that? Uh, wave your hand here at me. No. Anybody seeing that? No, Kurt? No. Okay. Anybody seeing anything? Looks like everyone's, Kevin, what do you have? Yeah, no, as a vendor, I would tell you, we have not had that issue. It's concerning, right? But we have not. I mean, I think some time the actual machine equipment has been a challenge as it's coming over, like finishing that. But it's interesting on the powder perspective, we haven't run into it. I mean, it, look, it, in the world we live in, it's not like I don't think about it, but it's we've been pretty stable from that perspective. It's probably more affected the equipment. Question from Tyson here. Does anyone modify surface finishes with secondary operations for aesthetics or texture of end use production parts? Peter, go ahead. Yeah, so we actually have the AMT vapor smoothing system as a surface finishing option for some of our thermoplastic parts. It works great on the HP parts, and we many times will just send an, a nice sample to a customer that orders an unfinished, un, you know, unfinished surface finish part. And more often than not, they come back and, and want to use that for their production method. It's an easy way to get an injection mold look on a uh, traditional HP MJF part. Excellent. Kevin, I'm going to throw this next question at you here. We've talked a lot about HP equipment today. I'm curious your perspective on that. I did see somebody in the comments say, hey, is this an HP commercial here? And so I just would love to give you an opportunity to address that and talk a little bit about the HP technology and why it's come up so frequently today. Yeah, so I was going to actually address that. In fact, I think I know Mark very well, so he's putting us on. But I mean, when I look at it, look, I'm passionate about HP in the sense that most, the reason, unfortunately, it's come up a lot is all these panelists have changed their businesses using HP technology. But I've been, a, and, and we resell it, but I think technology like HP and carbon, when you look at that throughput that they're talking about, like Kurt is very hard on FDM. Carbon and HP in particular created a volume you couldn't have done before. And look, we're going to continue to see people like Stratasys come out with competitive processes because 
of what we're seeing from a payoff perspective. So yeah, unfortunately, I always hate when this comes across because it sounds like an HP commercial because we're passionate about it. But we realize different technologies fit in different ways. But in this case, again, in particular, HP and Carbon have changed that production scale that we haven't seen. And that's why you're continuing to see the investment from others. The other question I think that was in there, David, is just overall costs. Look, we are talking production units, right? So you're looking, you know, starting at $100,000 up. And that's true, whether it be, again, us, Carbon, Stratasys. And so the, it is a bigger investment, but the return and the throughput is there. The cost to run it is lower. So that's one I, you know, we're getting back to ROI. Sometimes we look at that purchase price and we say, oh my gosh, it's $200,000. You know, one of the challenges I think like we've done in the 2D side, we look at it a monthly base, like a lease or a rental or some type of program. So I encourage you to not focus on that initial price, but what's the payoff long term, right? And how you do that. So hopefully I answered that and added something else to it because I didn't want to avoid that question either. Who asked that question? Do you remember, Kevin? Well, you're on mute. I again i think it was uh no, i know mark? mark asked the one about okay. the HP commercial i can't remember who asked about the price investment okay all right tj's got a follow-up here um asking about the interface he's he, i think he's wondering about the ease of use and teachability of say grabcad versus hp systems who's got a good answer for that kurt looks like you threw a response there in the chat you want to add to that and then i'll go to you peter yeah the 3d build manager software that comes with it is awesome load your parts in there um you can hollow them out if you want to, and push one button and send it to the printer. Same as GrabCAD. Sounds easy. Peter, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is uh, another area where there's been huge advancements, you know, software. So uh, a lot of these are, a lot of these different softwares are converging on kind of uh, same functionality. Two others that I'll just mention are, are going to be NetFab and Materialize Magics. You know, if you're going to look for the industry standards and where th this is heading. Excellent. Now I want to ask the audience a question, folks, get those little typing fingers ready. It's going to take you a moment to think. So go over to the chat, load it up. And here's what I want to know from you. What was something that you heard today? Something that you learned from uh, any of the panel here that has stuck out in your mind? What's the insight, the takeaway, something that you learned that was impactful from what the panel shared today? Tim here is saying, I see Tim over here in Zoom is saying Metal 3D is on the rise. Yeah, we heard that pretty, pretty unanimously across across the panel here. What else, folks? Drop that into the chat. And as, as you're doing that, I want to give the panel one more quick opportunity, folks. Give me a 10-second, 15-second answer here. What is something that nobody asked today that maybe I didn't bring to the table here that I should have asked you about 3D print? I'm going to start with you, Kurt. What's your thought on that? Mine would just be the cost um, of running the parts. You know, it's like keep uh, reiterating that, but low overall cost to run parts and get them out the door. Okay, good. I'll dig into that uh, some more next time then. Peter, what about you? What should I have asked that I didn't? I, you know, what part should you be 3D printing? And, uh, you know, ah. we get that on our end quite, uh, quite regularly. And we usually end up settling on the, not at all the part that they had initially thought that they should, you know, bring to, to our attention. It, it's a, a great scenario where we can, again, work with those people and help address that question and in the right way, answer it. Michael, what about you? What did I fail to ask? Maybe we didn't touch on it, but I just think putting, if you're going to talk about additive manufacturing production, I think we could have focused more of the conversation around like, what does it mean to really set up and run a business, right? Run a, a production industrial 3D printing cell. I think we touched on it very briefly, but let's just say you're an engineer or a hobbyist or an enthusiast in the technology. Running a production style business with employee, you know, managing employees and schedules and hitting on time delivery and all those metrics. That is a jarring experience. I can say personally going from the world of engineering into managing an operations level business. And if you're considering getting into this type of system, really think about that, go learn, you know, go talk to somebody who's done it. And I would recommend that before, before jumping in. It's not an easy thing to pull off. It's not impossible, but it's, it is tough. All righty. And Lita, what about you? What should I have asked? What should we have talked about that didn't get raised today? A little different topic, actually, but um, 
2020 really brought 3D to life, I think, in most households. And so it's a great time to be talking to your local governments and state governments on investment dollars that they might have, some of the new rollouts of dollars, and really talking to them about producing locally and helping with the supply chain issues. Big thing to be thinking about right now. Well, I want to thank the panel here. I want to be very respectful of their time and yours, folks. So I'm going to put this URL back up on the screen one more time. And if you have any questions, I've seen a number of these requests come in. Go to this URL here, 3D.mastergraphics.com, and uh, get some time on the calendar to talk to Kevin and his team. And uh, we'll take care of any additional questions that we didn't answer by you going there to that URL. Kevin, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say the final word, and then I will bring us to a close. Put the spot on me. No, again, I hope it is informative. <laughs> again, I appreciate the se session, especially the panelists. I mean, these guys are experts and ladies are experts in it. So again, appreciate everyone joining us. I know we're all busy and definitely let us know if it's worthwhile to do these things. But I um, appreciate you, David, leading it and doing such a great job. I want to take an opportunity to thank Kurt, Lita, Peter, and Michael. Thank you for your participation today. We appreciate your time. And most importantly, thank you to everybody who has assembled uh, this morning with us. We know that your time is uh, extremely valuable and that it's the most precious asset uh, that any of us have. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Kevin, for allowing us to pull this group together. And thank you to Kurt, Peter, and Michael, and Lita. We appreciate you all spending your time with us and, of course, the audience as well. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.